Virgin Galactic founder Richard Branson and five other people flew to the edge of space on the company's Spaceship 2 suborbital vehicle on July 11, culminating in an effort that started nearly 17 years ago. The Spaceship 2 vehicle, named VSS Unity, took off from Spaceport America in the southern New Mexican desert, attached to its White Knight 2 aircraft. The vehicles flew to an altitude of about 13.7 kilometers before White Knight 2 released Unity. After separation, Unity ignited its hybrid rocket motor to begin the boost phase. This carried Unity to its target altitude of 86 kilometers, where the pilots and crew experienced four minutes of weightlessness. They exited their seats and enjoyed sweeping views of the Earth below through the many round windows of the space plane's fuselage. After that short encounter with weightlessness, the crew climbs back into their seats as the vehicle prepares to return to Earth. The plane then glided back to Earth, landing on the runway at the Spaceport America to complete what the company called the Unity 22 mission. The entire flight from takeoff to landing took about 60 minutes to complete. The flight was the first to carry an entire crew of two pilots and four mission specialists in the vehicle's cabin, including the company's founder Sir Richard Branson, who tested private astronaut experience during the flight. Following the success of Unity 22, Virgin Galactic expects to launch commercial flights to suborbital space next year. To date, the firm has sold an estimated 600 tickets fetching a price of roughly $250,000 each. A spokesman for Virgin Galactic said SpaceX and Tesla CEO Elon Musk had bought a ticket for his own space ride. However, it's unclear where Musk stands in Virgin Galactic's line of 600 other prospective Spaceship 2 passengers. Shortly after the successful flight, the company announced a contest where it will be giving out two free tickets on one of its first commercial space flights. Virgin Galactic partnered with the charity fundraising platform Amas to conduct the sweepstakes. Participants can enter the contest either by donating money for the cause or without contributing. Eligible participants for the new contest must meet numerous conditions on the Amas website. Some of the main ones include being at least 18 years of age, coming from a worldwide jurisdiction not prohibited from participation, and providing proof of a coronavirus vaccination. The application closes on September 1st, and the winner will be announced on September 29th. The upper stage for the first flight of NASA's space launch system was installed on top of the heavy lift rocket, moving the agency one step closer to the liftoff of the Artemis 1 mission to the moon. Last month, ground crews mounted the SLS core stage between the rocket's side-mounted solid-fueled boosters, which were stacked on a mobile launch platform inside the vehicle assembly building earlier this year. The teams then added the launch vehicle stage adapter, a conical structure that tapes from the larger diameter of the core stage to the smaller upper stage. The interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or the upper stage, was lifted out of its storage container in the assembly building on July 5 by one of the cranes in the building. After final inspections, it was lifted into the high bay 3 integration cell and lowered down onto the upper flange of the stage adapter, where the two elements were mated. The interim cryogenic propulsion stage was built by United Launch Alliance and is based on the upper stage used on the company's Delta IV heavy rocket. The stage will provide the boost to send NASA's Orion crew capsule out of Earth orbit toward the moon on the Artemis 1 test flight. The 5-meter diameter cryogenic stage is powered by a single aerojet rocket Dyn RL-10B2 engine. The engine can produce a maximum thrust of 110 kN. The addition of the upper stage thus completed the stacking of the propulsive elements for the first SLS mission. Next will be the installation of the Orion stage adapter, followed by the Orion spacecraft. After a wet dress rehearsal at Launch Pad 39B, the first Artemis mission will lift off from Kennedy Space Center before the end of this year. Meanwhile, last week, NASA's near-Earth asteroid scout spacecraft was tucked away safely inside the SLS rocket to launch on the rocket's first mission. The solar sailing CubeSat is one of several secondary payloads hitching a right on Artemis 1. The spacecraft has been packaged into a dispenser and attached to the adapter ring that connects the SLS rocket and Orion spacecraft. The CubeSat will use 6.8 meters stainless steel alloy booms to deploy an aluminum-coated plastic film sail, which is 2.5 micrometers thick. The large area sail will generate thrust by reflecting sunlight. Photons from the sun bounce off the solar sail to give it a gentle constant push. Over time, this constant thrust can accelerate the spacecraft to very high speeds, allowing it to navigate through space. Catching a right on Artemis 1, the spacecraft will deploy from the space launch system after the Orion spacecraft is separated from the upper stage. Coal gas thrusters will provide the initial propulsive maneuvers to place the CubeSat on the right trajectory. Once it reaches the lunar vicinity, it will perform imaging for instrument calibration. 
After deploying the sail and sailing on sunlight, the spacecraft will begin an approximate two-year journey to fly by a near-Earth asteroid. Once it reaches its destination, the spacecraft will use a science-grade camera to capture images of the asteroid, which scientists will then study to further our understanding of these small but important solar system neighbors. Near-Earth Asteroid Scout is also a stepping stone to another NASA solar sail mission, dubbed Solar Cruiser, which will use a sail 16 times larger when it flies in 2025. NASA and the U.S. Department of Energy have teamed up to fund three design concepts for reactors that could become part of a nuclear thermal propulsion system. The newly announced contracts will be awarded through the Idaho National Laboratory, and each contract is worth up to $5 million. The money will fund 12 months of development work culminating in the production of a reactor design concept. Nuclear thermal propulsion technology works by transferring heat from the reactor to a liquid propellant. The liquid propellant will convert into a gas and expands through a nozzle to provide thrust to propel the spacecraft. It's a potential technology for crew and cargo missions to Mars and science missions to the outer solar system, enabling faster and more robust missions in many cases. The system provides high thrust and twice the propellant efficiency of chemical rockets. The three companies that received contracts are Virginia-based BWX Technologies which will work with Lockheed Martin. General Atomics Electromagnetic Systems of San Diego, which will partner with X-Energy and Aerojet Rocketdyne. Seattle-based Ultrasafe Nuclear Technologies, whose partners are Ultrasafe Nuclear Corporation and six other companies. At the end of the contract's performance periods, Idaho National Laboratory will conduct design reviews of the reactor concepts and provide recommendations to NASA. NASA will utilize the information to establish the basis for future technology design and development efforts. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Super Heavy Booster 3 prototype has survived its first major test seemingly without an issue, opening the door for a static fire. On Monday, July 12, SpaceX proceeded to perform a cryogenic proof test on Booster 3. During the test, the 70 meters tall stainless steel vehicle was pressurized with cryogenic liquid nitrogen to simulate the pressure and temperature its propellant tanks will experience during flight. Surprisingly, only a small amount of frost formed on the outside of the propellant tanks in two hours of activity, indicating that SpaceX likely chose a more cautious approach during the cryo-proof test. In short, Booster 3 was likely filled with a few hundred tons of liquid nitrogen relative to the more than 3,000 tons its tanks could easily hold. The next step in the Booster 3 test campaign is a static fire test, during which the vehicle's propellant tanks will be filled with liquid methane and oxygen to ignite the Raptor engines for a few seconds, as the gigantic booster remains grounded to the test stand. As part of preparations for the static fire test, Raptor engines were installed on the booster prototype last week. The first booster Raptor engine was installed on July 10, ahead of the cryogenic proof test on July 12. Later, two more Raptors were delivered to the Starbase launch site and installed into Booster 3, one after the other. By July 13, SpaceX had installed all three Raptor engines required for the first Super Heavy static fire test. Currently, the booster has Raptor engine serial numbers 57, 59, and 62 installed in it. The engines were installed in an odd triangular configuration on the booster's central 9-engine thrust puck, and why that particular configuration was chosen instead of something more symmetric is unclear. SpaceX CEO Elon Musk recently revealed that SpaceX had finally settled on a crucial aspect of Super Heavy's design, determining that operational Starship boosters will ultimately be outfitted with 33 sea-level Raptor engines. He added that all the engines on the booster are the same, apart from removing gimballing capability and thrust vector actuators for the outer 20 engines. With the engines installed and ready to fire, SpaceX aims to roll Super Heavy's first static fire test this week. In his tweet, Elon Musk mentioned that the static fire would occur probably on Monday, July 19. Road closures are scheduled for the roads surrounding SpaceX's Starbase facility for Monday between 12 p.m. and 10 p.m., while backup dates for testing are also in place for Tuesday and Wednesday. Even though three engines were installed into the booster, the static fire test would likely be conducted with only one of the three engines. If that's the case, the current configuration is just a part of the incomplete process of installing five or more engines for additional static fires in the coming weeks. The eighth segment of the orbital launch tower got rolled to the build site last Wednesday. This segment is shorter than the previous seven segments and has some additional features added to it. One of the four vertical columns of this segment has a solid end plate attached to it. In order to install the eighth segment of the tower, on July 11, workers extended a Lieber crane by adding additional crane parts that had been delivered to Starbase two weeks earlier. 
The eighth segment of the tower got stacked atop the integration tower on July 18. The solid end plate on the section is now pointing directly towards the orbital launch pad. This end plate may hold the pulley for the Starship stacking mechanism. Meanwhile, in a May 6 letter to SpaceX from the Federal Aviation Administration, the agency warns that the company's work on the launch tower is yet unapproved and will be included in the agency's ongoing environmental review of the SpaceX facility in Boca Chica. According to an FAA spokesperson, SpaceX is building the tower at its own risk and the environmental review could recommend taking down the launch tower. The FAA's warning came in response to SpaceX saying in a prior letter that the launch tower should be exempt from FAA's environmental review because it's only used for production, research, and development purposes and not for FAA-licensed or permitted launches. However, the FAA argues that SpaceX's description of the tower indicates otherwise. The FAA cited a SpaceX document that the towers would be used to integrate the Starship and Super Heavy launch vehicles. The FAA had completed an environmental review of the Boca Chica site in 2014, but it told SpaceX in their warning letter that the integration tower is substantially taller than the water tower and lightning towers it had previously assessed. The FAA letter also stated that the integration tower could be as high as 480 feet, or about almost 147 meters, which is 11 feet taller than the previously proposed 469 feet tower. In short, as part of the agency's environmental assessments, SpaceX needs to ensure that the Starship system won't harm nearby wildlife or ecosystems around its Boca Chica launch site. Without FAA approval and the launch license, SpaceX's first Starship orbital mission could be delayed. Meanwhile, in a separate set of news, Yusaku Mizawa, the Japanese entrepreneur who bought the first crewed flight aboard Starship, provided an update on his Dear Moon mission contest. The Dear Moon contest announced in March was looking for eight crew members to fly along with Mr. Mizawa in a Starship rocket on a voyage around the moon. In the latest update, the Japanese billionaire shared that 1 million participants from 249 countries and regions around the world participated in the contest, and the contest is nearing the end of the selection process. The video Mizawa shared on Thursday provides a glimpse of who can potentially win the flight to space. It features a diverse group of people with a variety of talents and aspirations. The Dear Moon mission is expected to occur no earlier than 2023. Moving on to other Starship updates, the second ground support equipment tank shell was delivered to the launch site last Monday. And the next day, the shell was lifted and placed at the tank farm with the help of a crane. The tank farm now consists of two GSE tanks, two cryo shells, and one water tank. SpaceX has begun rapidly assembling the first orbital Starship prototype and the Super Heavy booster at the build site. The aft section and engine skirt of Starship SN20 were mated inside the mid-bay last week. With one more stacking operation, joining the propellant tank section and the aft section of the prototype, the stacking of SN20 will be almost 60% complete. The nose cone of SN20 is currently being built inside the nose cone manufacturing tent at the factory. The aft flap of Starship serial number 20 was spotted at the production site on July 16. This is the first time that curved thermal protection tiles have been found on the flap of a Starship prototype. Being an orbital-class Starship prototype, Starship SN20 should have heat tiles on its entire windward side to protect the spacecraft from the heat of atmospheric re-entry. SpaceX teams at Starbase began stacking Super Heavy Booster 4 last week. The common dome and a four-ring oxygen tank section of the booster were mated together last week. Four more stainless steel ring sections marked for Booster 4 are waiting to be assembled at the production site. Even though Elon Musk hopes to stack Starship serial number 20 and Booster 4 this month, this is highly unlikely to happen by the end of July. A booster hold-down structure is presently being built at the factory. The structure could be used as a working platform for launch preparations at the launch site. The structure could be installed onto the newly built foundation at the launch site, and the hold-down clamps built into the system can be used to secure Super Heavy boosters for pre-flight checks and inspections. Recently two new methane flare stacks were installed at the build site. Flare stacker flare boom is used for burning off flammable gas released by safety valves during unplanned overpressuring of plant equipment. Previously SpaceX used a flare stack at the Starship launch site to prevent large-scale accumulation of excess methane during early Starship tests. But in May 2020, Elon Musk mentioned that SpaceX would be recondensing methane using solar power, and eventually, the flare stack at the launch site was replaced with a methane recondenser. The new flare stacks installed were connected to the natural gas power plant, which uses methane to run massive generators to power the air separation unit. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week.
Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.